I raised my hand and I said, I'm, I'm confused. Like, when are we going to actually begin the retraining? What can I do as a manager to take this information back to my staff and enforce policies and procedures that would help protect uh, women who are experiencing um, either sex trafficking or abuse in any way? And she immediately, you know, shot me down and she said, we're not here to talk about that, Ramona. We are here to teach you how to identify if you're being videotaped or recorded or entrapped in any way. How did you begin working at Planned Parenthood and when was that? I began working for Planned Parenthood in the spring of 2008. And it really started with a phone call from a former coworker of mine. We, the both of us used to work for the WIC program, which is the Women, Infants, and Children's Nutrition Program. She began working for Planned Parenthood first and then found out that there was an opening in this Sherman location in Texas. And she called me and said, I think you'd be great for this position. I initially applied thinking I was going to um, be the family planning assistant but then after they reviewed my resume, they offered me the position of manager on the spot. Um, I was very excited for that opportunity, so I jumped at it. How did you view Planned Parenthood at that time? Well, I think it's important for people to, to remember that I did not work at an abortion facility. So, you know, starting working for them, I, in my mind, it's just you know an affordable gynecologist somewhere where low-income women uh, receive the same services as they do at any gynecologist's office. Can you describe once you started working there how that view may have changed or it developed once you actually started to manage the facility? You know it's funny the view changed during the time in which I was doing the interview process. I, I went in thinking and having one perception about Planned Parenthood and what my position would entail as a manager of a non-abortion facility. But once we started talking through the, you know, during the interview about uh, what my views were on abortion or Plan B, for example, I realized that I didn't know a lot about this subject matter. Uh, for example, asking about Plan B. I didn't even know what emergency contraception was, so I kind of just fumbled my way through the answer because I was more focused on getting the job. So that forced me to start thinking and contemplating what am I going to uh, face once I start working here? And am I really going to have to confront the issue of abortion head on? And in my mind, I really thought I wasn't, I wouldn't have to. Um, that quickly changed after uh, just a, maybe just a few months of working there and having to offer the first abortion referral. Do you remember the first time you referred for an abortion? Can you tell us what, what, what that was like? I can. I still remember um, the face of the young lady. I still remember the situation. I still remember exactly everything, all the details of that very first abortion referral. I think because that's the moment that I really began to rationalize what I was doing and make justifications for my job. And I really had to face and confront something that was very, um, that was a conflict for me personally. Uh, this, this young woman, she was a college age student. Uh, she came in and, and, you know, I think she had taken a pregnancy test at home. She wanted to confirm with us. And I was still new, so I had failed to see that on her form she requested information for, for abortion. Uh, I congratulated her on her pregnancy, and she began to just weep. And that's when I realized my mistake, that I had failed to see that she was asking for um, an abortion referral. I began to backpedal immediately and, and thought to myself, how am I going to get myself out of this? Because at that moment, it became a moral conflict for me. So when I was confronted with that moment, uh, I, I had a choice to make, uh, either take a stand for life or to uh, start to rationalize, justify so that I could keep my job. Ultimately, I, um, I gave her the referral and she left in tears and I went back into my office and closed the door and began to cry. Uh, and it still, I, I struggle trying to comprehend what really, what, what that was about, what, what all those tears were for, and 
and really I feel like now looking back it was the moment that I compromised everything that I had believed in and um, opened myself up to these um, really just the relativism that we that we deal with so often about women and the choices they make and not making judgments. Did you, Ramona, in that position, having your own sense of wanting to support life, you know, it sounds like that's how you were feeling. Did you want to be able to give her pregnancy resources, but there were none to offer? I mean, you, you ended up handing her the abortion referral. Was there any other, are there any other options for her? Mm -hmm. You know, I think, I think one of the reasons that I struggled to initially was I was 16 and pregnant. I had been in myself, uh, you know, a vulnerable situation. Uh, in which I chose life. And I wanted to share that with her. I wanted to share my own experience and my own testimony of how, you know, choosing that life didn't mean that it was a death sentence for me, right? You know, I was able to to go on and, and do great things. But, you know, I, I didn't really know how to offer those resources for her and still be able to keep my job. That's what I felt. Like how how do I say, you know, you should really reconsider this and um, still be able to keep that title of manager. What would happen, Ramona, uh, at your facility when a woman would call or come in who was pregnant, who was looking for pregnancy related services? There was nothing to offer these women. Uh, many times I felt um, that I couldn't help in the way that I wanted to help. For example, prenatal care. There was no prenatal care. There was nothing that we could offer women who were pregnant. Uh, there was nothing that we could offer for women seeking fertility treatments or trying to con who were trying to conceive. Uh, another issue that we ran into quite often was when women would come in who had a legitimate problem uh, for example, polycystic ovary syndrome, uh, or maybe fibroids, or something like that, who we could not diagnose because there were no ultrasound technicians or any type of ultrasound other than the ultrasound that is available at the abortion facilities. Uh, again, that's the idea. You go in with the perception that Planned Parenthood is there to help women in any situation, not just when they're wanting an abortion. You think gynecological services. You think affordable you know, health care for low-income women, non-insured women. So I really went in believing we're just like a gynecologist. Uh, then you realize as time goes by that you're not. As a manager of the facility and going in with that kind of thought of, oh, I can help women with these health needs, how did that make you feel when you would have to say to these different women, no, I can't help with that? Mm -hmm. I think disillusioned is the perfect word. Uh, that's really how I felt. I went in really wanting um, to help, and I had this, I've always had this really strong desire to help people who are struggling. Uh, and so that's really the mantra of Planned Parenthood, isn't it? You know, to help women and to provide these services for women. And, and where are they going to go if Planned Parenthood doesn't exist, right? And so as you're going through your day-to-day -day routine and realizing that these women are encountering uh, real problems that, that really you can't help because everything is limited to contraception and abortion. While you were managing the Planned Parenthood facility, what was your opinion about the standard of care for patients? Mm -hmm. You know, I, for me, it, it was a struggle because I felt like Planned Parenthood treated women like cattle. Uh, it became more evident over time in the way in which our um, interim CEO came in and changed mm -hmm. the way in which we scheduled our patients. Uh, it, there was a meeting once in which we talked about switching over to the new scheduling software and reducing the amount of time that we saw our, uh, what we called initial patients, which were new patients. Oftentimes these new patients were, were minors. And part of our policy for minors is that we spent more time and we had a different set of health uh, questions for them, a separate, um, you know, form that they filled out. So for me, even being a mom of, of two, you know, young girls, 
uh, it, it just it was just a conflict to see us go from maybe spending 30 minutes to now 15 minutes with these young girls. And the idea behind this, of course, was to pack the schedule to get um, more people in and more people out. And for me, that was just um, unacceptable. You mentioned, Ramona, that Planned Parenthood cut the time spent with clients from 30 minutes to 15 minutes during your time there. Why did that happen? We were under a great deal of pressure to meet both clinic revenue and patient quota. So, you know, obviously, if you can reduce the amount of time that we're spending with our patients, then we can have more room to fill the schedule. Uh, that was very troublesome because when you're dealing with an initial patient, most often minor patients, uh, and that time is reduced, you don't have as, as long of, um, of that one-on-one -on -one with the patient to discuss different birth control options. And not only are you not discussing the options, but once the option is made, if she wants you know, oral contraception or Depo-Provera, for example, to be able to discuss a, how those function, how they work, and to educate them on how to actually use those uh, methods of contraception. How did that impact care with minors, especially you, you know, young girls coming in, maybe the parents aren't even aware who you're prescribing, say, birth control to? How did that impact them? Um, you know, it, it's, it's hard to say you know, what the fallout was and what the result was of that. But I know that just even as a, on a clinical level, it just seems unethical to not spend that time with your patient and provide the proper care and explanation um, for something as serious as birth control. Because we know that if birth control, especially oral contraceptions, if they're not taken properly, then the effectiveness of those oral contraceptions go down. And if that happens, then of course, naturally a, a young girl can become pregnant um, and the next option for her is abortion. You've shared before about a conflict you had with a supervisor about referring to a pro-life pregnancy care center. Can you share more about that story? Mm -hmm. When I began working for Planned Parenthood, apparently um, the former manager that worked there before I got there was referring women to um, the local pregnancy care center. Uh, there was a phone number and an address in the Rolodex with their information on it. Um, I think at some point that disappeared, <laughs> so I made another card <laughs> with their information uh, because they provided free pregnancy tests and we did not. So it was very common to get women who came in asking for a free pregnancy test or saying that they couldn't afford the $25 pregnancy test. Uh, and if we offered anything for free, um, and since we didn't, I always referred them to the Pregnancy Care Center. I had no idea that that was an issue. Uh, again, I was very naive about, you know, who Planned Parenthood was and who the Pregnancy Care Center, you know, what they represented and, you know, their um, stance. So for me, it just seemed very natural. Okay, we don't offer this service for free, so I'm going to help someone who needs it, right? Um, I was, you know, um, it was called to my attention by my one of my supervisors that we do not refer women to the pregnancy care center. And um, she said, let's just say they're not very pro-Planned Parenthood. You were working at Planned Parenthood while there were several national undercover investigations going on of Planned Parenthood. Can you tell me more about what that experience was like while working there? Mm -hmm. Well, when I came on in 2008, I, I'm assuming that I came midway during one of those investigations because I remember us having a wanted poster of Lila Rose on our <laughs> bulletin board. Uh, I, I don't recall exactly everything that that invest, investigation entailed, um, but I do remember being on the watch for Miss Lila Rose coming into one of our locations. That we've met before. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And I just blew it off. I thought, you know, this is ridiculous. If, if we have something to hide, then, you know, that's different, but we don't have anything to hide, so why are we so concerned about these undercover investigations? I, I guess that's kind of like how I grew up as a child. If you have nothing to hide, then you have nothing to fear, right? 
And so I just went about my business and we did, we did us, you know, we did our thing. Uh, and also I felt like it was more um, geared towards the abortion facilities and that we never really, it never really posed a threat to us mm -hmm. at the non-abortion facilities. Mm -hmm. Of course, later on, uh, during my tenure, all of that would change. Uh, in the um, beginning of 2011, another investigation, undercover investigation came out exposing Planned Parenthood workers uh, aiding and abetting in underage sex trafficking. Uh, that's when uh, I became more disillusioned and more disgusted with this organization uh, because of the way in which Planned Parenthood reacted. And how did Planned Parenthood leadership react? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, PPFA, which Planned Parenthood Federation of America, went out uh, publicly saying that they would retrain all of their staff uh, on reporting abuse, on how they reported abuse. And the training was to make sure that sex traffickers, sexual abuse cover-up was detected and reported. That's the that's, assumption. Was that the yes. way they communicated it to you? Okay. Yes, that's, that's the idea that we all had. That was our perception. Uh, a meeting was called among different locations, and we all gathered, depending on where we were located, uh, accordance to just geographical location. And when we were called into this meeting, I um, went in really believing that Planned Parenthood could redeem themselves. They're going to prove that they really do care about women, and this is something that really concerns them. So walking into this um, this this facility because it was, it was the training was held at another uh, Planned Parenthood center. I walk into the room. It's dark. We we sign in and there's a projector screen pulled down, and we um, were called to meeting right, and they begin to play all of the previous undercover investigations that had been um, put out. You know about Planned Parenthood. They were playing recordings of people who had called in uh, to Planned Parenthood, for example, saying, uh, asking the question, if I donate money, can you um, guarantee or assure me that this money will go specifically toward aborting an African-American baby? Uh, and so just different things like that, different scenarios. And I became very perplexed. I thought, you know, what's going on here? You know, how, you know, I kind of, I guess, you know, one looks at their watch and thinks, okay, when are we going to really get to the important issue, right? Uh, initially, I also maybe wondered, are we talking, are we showing these things because we're, they're trying to show us um, what not to do, you know, the things mm -hmm. that are wrong, that we don't do these, <laughs> these things. Mm -hmm. And so as time went on, I raised my hand and I said, I'm, I'm confused, like when are we going to um, actually begin the retraining? What can I do as a manager to take this information back to my staff and put, uh, in, you know, enforce policies and procedures that would help protect uh, women who are experiencing um, either sex trafficking or abuse, sexual abuse of in, in, any, in any way? Because that's a difficult subject to talk about if you ever have a patient come in who expresses that. Mm. And so I really wanted to know how we dealt with that. And she immediately, you know, shot me down and she said, we're not here to talk about that, Ramona. We are here to teach you how to identify if you're being videotaped or recorded or entrapped in any way. At that moment, my heart just sunk. I was completely filled with disgust. Uh, I know I use the word disillusioned often and that's the best word that I can use. Um, but at that point, my disillusionment turned into just pure disgust. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I couldn't believe that we were actually um, there to, to train on how to identify if we're being recorded. Uh, again, it goes back to why do, do we have something to hide? Why, why is this an issue for us? That experience for me left me so disgusted that I couldn't see how Planned Parenthood could ever redeem themselves after that. At the retraining or shortly after, did you get a sense for how other Planned Parenthood workers felt about the retraining to identify investigators instead of retraining to identify actual traffickers or abuse? Mm -hmm. You know, as I looked around the room, I wondered, am I the only one who's feeling this way? Am I the only one who's reacting this way? 
And um, for the most part, it's just kind of hard to tell. Like it was hard to, to, to read their expressions and their reactions. Some of them, as they watched these videos, these undercover videos, they would scoff and they would mm -hmm. laugh and they would mock you know, the, the investigators. Um, it was funny to them. It was just, it was for them, it was just kind of like, oh, these people are crazy, right? And um, almost just in support of the employee, the Planned Parenthood employees. But then I would kind of look at some of the others and they seemed like they were kind of perplexed by it as well. Um, but never did I, you know, communicate with any of them or pick up the phone and say, hey, you know, what do you think about this? Um, now, my coworker, one of my coworkers, she actually rode with me in my car to the, the retraining. And um, she did. She did discuss with me on the way back how she also was very disgusted and disillusioned and she couldn't believe what had just happened. For people who may still be working at Planned Parenthood and may be feeling disillusioned or feeling not at peace with what they're doing, what would you say to them? I think it's very simple. Um, hope uh, and, and believing and trusting that there are people on the other side who are waiting with open arms to help in any way possible, uh, that they don't have to feel like they're stuck there, and that eventually things will work out and they can move on and be happy. Ramona, it's been five years now since you left Planned Parenthood. How has your life changed? We lost so much um, when I made the decision to leave Planned Parenthood and um, especially material, materially speaking, <laughs> we lost so much, um, but we gained um, the, the world, like we gained eternity, right, as a family, because we shifted in our way of thinking and in our growth as far as um, our faith. Um, our faith journey has been incredible, um, but most especially, I look at our two youngest children, um, Philip and Ramaya, who are four and 16 months. Uh, Philip is who I call my conversion baby, but really we could say that both of them are our mm -hmm. conversion babies. And it's hard to look at their faces. Um, it's really hard to say, to talk about it without crying, um, to think about our two little ones who possibly would not be here today had I still been working at Planned Parenthood because I was closed to having um, more children. My husband and I were not open to having more kids. Um, and then miraculously, after I left, we both became open to life. And so every time I look at them, I think this is, these are my kids. These, I can't imagine my world, um, a world without them. Those are beautiful kids too. Thank you. <laughs> I had to see a picture earlier and they're, they're gorgeous. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ramona, for your time here. And so grateful for your courage and your witness. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.